Um, I have a sermon on my heart this morning. Uh, as you know, we've been in a series on restoration, <clears throat> and I was set to continue my the restoration uh, st- uh, deal, but I felt like <clears throat> the Lord put this sermon on my heart, and I it's kind of left field. It has uh, it's not part of the series I was planning, but uh, I do believe it is for some people either with us today or going to be watching online. And I feel the heart of compassion. I feel God's compassion for the, peop- the recipients of the sermon. <clears throat> so if it's for you, then um, I'm so thrilled for you. And uh, I think it's a little for me as well. So it's good to have you here. The sermon is called The Psalm of the Precious Secret. The Psalm of the Precious Secret. Uh, there are six psalms that David uses the term miktam in. And... Mektam is a phrase that is much debated in, in theological circles. And so I want to take you to what Charles Spurgeon said about Mektam, and I'm going to read you what he said. He said, this is usually understood to mean the golden psalm, and such a title is most appropriate, for the matter is of the most fine gold. Ainsworth calls it David's jewel or notable song. Dr. Alexander thinks that the word is most probably a simple derivative of a word signifying to hide and signifies a secret or a mystery, and indicates the depth of doctrinal and spiritual import in these sacred compositions. If this be true, the true interpretation, when the two are put together, they make up the name which every reader will remember, and which will bring the precious subject at once to mind, the psalm of the precious secret. So miktam means something that is treasured and hidden, the psalm of the hidden treasure or the precious secret. It's very interesting. There are six psalms. I'm going to focus on one uh, today, uh, but the the six psalms of Psalm 16 and then from 56 through to 60. Psalm 16, I'm not going to, you can go and do the others yourself, but um, Psalm 16 is about my focus. Psalm 57 is about my fellowship. Psalm 58 is about my favor. Psalm 59 is about my fortress. Psalm 60 is about my foe. And today we're going to look at Psalm 58, so Psalm 56, which is about my fear. And so let me take you to the beginnings of the uh, chapter on Psalm 56. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. Good, it's nice to have you. <laughs> for the director of music, to the tune of a dove on distant oaks. For the musos, this is for the musos in the room. There are, there are uh, a number of melodies that David repeated in his psalms. There's a dove on distant oaks, there's the doe of the valley, there's do not destroy. There's a, there's a few melodies that were consistent. And so David wrote multiple psalms to the same melody. And uh, so some of you get, uh, sometimes you get a melody in your heart. Uh, the scripture says in Colossians, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sometimes when you want to worship and you don't have words, that's okay, the melody is, is enough. That was for free and for the musos. <clears throat> to the tune of a dove on distant oaks, of David, a miktam, a precious secret, a hidden secret. When the Philistines had seized him in Gath. So let me bring you into the context of the psalm because that's the beginning of the psalm. David, that was David's notes to the worship leader. This is a miktam. This is a psalm of a, of a precious secret. I've discovered something, David said, and I wrote this psalm, and it's a precious secret to me, and I hope you get it. Saul had, uh, had David come into his service. David had killed Goliath. You remember the, the beautiful story? Saul had brought David into his service because David was a, a, was a a really anointed musician, uh, <clears throat> at the end of his life, they call him Israel's beloved singer of songs. And so David began to minister before Saul, and every time Saul had, had a demon, right? And every time the demon became troublesome, David would come and play, and the demon would be quiet, and Saul would find relief. And uh, so, but Saul increasingly becomes jealous of David because everything David does has the favor and the blessing of God on it. And Saul, who used to be in that position of the favor and the blessing of God, was, and God has now moved away from Saul, and Saul is feeling bereft. And so he becomes jealous of David. And so he increasingly tries to get David killed by sending him on uh, more and more dangerous missions. He gives David uh, uh, some troops. He makes him a commander in the army. And then he says, go and attack those people. And, and uh, 
David keeps doing it, and the Lord keeps blessing him, and David keeps having tremendous success. So while Saul's plan is to get David killed, actually what's happening is David is getting more and more respected and revered. And every time David does something beautiful and comes back, everybody sings his praises more, which exacerbates the problem. And so Saul has got to a place where he's meant to kill David. So twice while David has been playing to Saul while he's been harassed, twice Saul is trying to stab him to death. You think you've got problems, you know. And so... (laughs) David has run out, and uh, the second time, David, you know, kind of, it dawns on David. This may not, this may be dangerous, you know, if I stay here. And so Saul has a a, a feast, and David decides he's not going to attend the feast. And he says to Jonathan, who he has a great friendship with, he says, listen, we're going to check out how, what happens with your dad. When, when I not, don't show at the feast, if your dad goes, hey, where's David? And you say, oh, you know, he's gone. A family member needed him. And, and your dad says, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll see him next week because then, then it's probably I'm safe. But if your dad throws all his toys and goes, oh, you know, how dare you? Then we'll know, you know, it's probably time for me to leave. So that's what happens. Saul goes, where's David? And Jonathan says, oh, he had to go help. Her. I said, it's fine. And Saul just loses it. And then he starts cursing his son, Jonathan. He curses his mother. He's, he just loses it. And so Jonathan <clears throat> and, and David have arranged this. Jonathan takes a, a little armor bearer out, and he's pretending he's doing bone arrow. He's practicing with his arrow, and he shoots his arrow. He's arranged a signal with David. If I say it to the guy, go further, then... Anyway, long story short, they meet, and uh, David and Jonathan realize that they're not going to see each other much. Uh, And uh, David realizes it's time to run, because Saul is out to kill me. Saul has declared this to Jonathan. He said, I'm going to kill this man, because as long as David's alive, your throne is not secure. So David runs, uh, but he's he's really didn't do a lot of planning, and he doesn't have much with him. So he runs to the, the priest at Nob, and he asks them, do you have anything to eat? And they give him the showbread, which they put out in front of the ark, and then they would take it off. And he says, do you have any weapons here? And they said, yeah, we've got the sword of Goliath. That, remember when you killed Goliath? Yeah, you, you, put it, you gave it to us, and we've kept it all this time. And David says, that's great. There's no sword like it. And so David now takes you know, the sword of Goliath, and I think it's dragging on the floor. <laughs> and he's now walking. It's got, you know, he's, he's full, and he's weaponized. And David decides, what should I do? Because anywhere in Israel, because the king hates me and the king has a massive army behind him and they're all sworn to kill the enemies of the king, I have to get out of Israel. So he says, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go to the Philistines because I'll seek political asylum amongst the Philistines. And the biggest Philistine city was Gath. So he goes to Gath. And Gath was with Goliath was from. Goliath was the champion of Gath. And so I don't know if he thought the whole thing through. You know, you know, how, you know how you get a picture in your mind about they're going to welcome me and they're going to go, oh, yay, political asylum and help us. And, and, and I'm going to kind of be a celebrity there. And so he's, you know, he's walking into Gath and uh, not quite working out. So verse Verse 10 in 1 Samuel 21 says, That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. So David is walking down the street of Gath. He's like, Hi, sword of Goliath. And it's not going as well as his, you know, the picture was great, but the, it's, you know, these little people whispering, and then the mood of the crowd has gone ugly. And he, he's now, uh, it doesn't say it in Samuel, but in the psalm it says, when they seized him in Gath. So they grabbed a hold of David. And someone in the crowd spoke up, and that's why he wasn't ripped limb from limb by the crowd. And they said, let's see what Achish has to say. So they take him to the king, Achish, and Achish's servants are all going, this is, the, this is the guy, killed tens of thousands of us. Not just our champion, but he, he's the guy who caused the death of 
I, my cousin and my brother, one guy's going, my father, this guy. And David is in this place of his disillusionment. This hasn't gone at all like I thought. There's a mixture of fear and irritation and disappointment with himself. How could I have been so stupid? Now his enemies have seized him, and they are merciless and taunting and exulting and provocative and hateful. And the crowd's mood has changed. It's dark and ugly. You know that when it gets beyond where it's, you know, you feel that moment where the crowd is no longer controllable. And you feel your heart slipping into great fear. Verse 12 says, Then David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. When they said, this guy, this guy, and they seized him, and the crowd is clamoring for blood, and the servants of the king are saying, this is the, this is the source of all our problems. And he's awaiting the judgment, because if Achish agrees, he's dead. Now, the Bible says, when David wrote Psalm 56, they threw him in prison, awaiting Achish's decision, and he wrote the psalm. So it wasn't on the deck chair under happy smiles. There, were, there weren't doves cooing and he wasn't... He was probably a little beaten. And great fear, the Bible says, great fear seized his heart. That's why this is the psalm of the precious secret. What do you do when fear has got on the inside of you? Because with the greatest of intent and with the purest of desire and with the noblest of motives, those of us who follow Jesus are still going to find ourselves in places where fear attacks. I don't care how cute you are, how strong you are, how spiritual you are, you are going to find yourself sometime in that place where fear looks big. And the question is, what do we do when fear rises up inside of us, sneaks in and overtakes us? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, because you go, oh, Greg, you, you speak in unbelief now. No, Paul said, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest because we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside and fears within. There are some times when you're facing issues that are bigger than you and the pressure's been longer than you thought you could handle and the fear creeps on the inside of you. And David is sitting there in a jail cell awaiting his imminent death by people who hate him. And everybody who's walking past the jail cell, everybody is talking about a different way to kill him. Everybody's saying, no, no, let's not just kill him quickly. Let's do it slow. He's surrounded by people who hate him, full of his own misgivings, full of his own irritation with himself. I brought this on me. How silly could I have been? And we know from the opening inscription of this psalm that David wrote this in this time of fear when he was seized in enemy territory and was abandoned by everyone but the Lord. And you may be facing something. It may not be as dire as that. But some of you face a fear that creeps on the inside of you. So what does the psalm of the precious secret show us about fear? What do we do when we are very much afraid, as the Bible says David was? So let me take you to three parts of this precious secret, I believe. The precious secret, part one, describe your problems to the Lord. See, I was taught, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't burden the Lord with your issues. And that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. If you're in trouble, you should pray. You should burden it. It says, cast your care on the Lord because He cares for you. It goes like, like, unburden yourself. Come and talk to me. And so you have this reality where David describes the problem to the Lord. So he says, verse 1, Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, hoping to take my life. 
There have been moments when fear comes, and the best thing you can do, the secret, David says, he writes it down in the psalm. Lord, Lord, I want you to just be aware. Look at what they're doing. Here's the problem, Lord. Here's what I'm experiencing. Now, you and I both know that my perspective and your perspective in any given set of circumstances are not the truth. They're just my perspective. But they're my truth. I've been, I've been wrong often in my perspective. But it's still mine. And so David comes to the Lord and he goes, Lord, let me tell you what's going on. This business deal that I've slaved over has gone south. That person there who's wheeling and dealing, they're going to cut me out. That person there is slandering me. Lord, let me tell you what's going on. Can, can I just take a moment and tell you what I'm facing right now? That's not a bad thing to do. As long as that's not the only thing you do. Henry Cloud says, when you get into a situation like that, you have to understand three things. It's not personal. This always happens to me. Why me? <laughs> See, the enemy, this is one of the greatest ploys of the enemy. The enemy comes to you and goes, listen, the, you look around you. See all these beautifully spiritual people. They're all beautiful. You are the problem. And it only happens to you because of that thing you did last Thursday or whatever. You are the problem. These people all have no problems, but you have the fear because you deserve it. You ugly thing. Tries to make it personal. This is about you. It's not personal, it's not permanent. This will never change. This always happens. This is my life. No, this is your current set of circumstances. This is my life. No, it's not. This is today. Tomorrow's coming. Yesterday. This is not your life. This is not permanent. It just happens to be the set of circumstances you're in right now. David goes on, becomes king, does a whole bunch of stuff. God blesses him. This happened to be a tough patch. This wasn't a happy day. And it's not pervasive. It's not personal. It's not permanent. It's not pervasive. Everything goes wrong. Nothing ever goes right. No. No. Right now, David is writing a, 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 a song in his in jail, hidden away, writes a song that billions of people have poured over. If he could have monetized that, he would have been wealthy. If iTunes existed, you know, David would have... He wrote a psalm in the middle of this. His whole life wasn't a mess. He wrote a psalm that billions of people have sung. It's not pervasive. And when your pressure comes and when your fear comes, you go, oh, it's personal, it's permanent, and it's pervasive. Every area of my life is like this. No, it's not. It's that one area and this, at this one moment from one perspective. Precious secret part two. Tell the Lord the problem. Ask for specific outcomes. Go, I'm paralyzed. I'm being beaten and it's probably my fault. I'm just going to sit here and take it because that's going to honor the Lord. No, it's not. You ask the Lord for specific outcomes. David says, because of their wickedness, don't let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Not just one or two. He says, bring the, bring the Philistine nation down. They're taking me off. Record my misery. List my tears in your scroll. Are oh, they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help, and by this I will know that you're for me. He says, Lord, get them and sort that thing out. And that ambition and that thing and this thing, change it, Lord. Some of you need to learn how to pray some aggressive prayers. Some of you, when fear comes, okay, Lord, this is the problem. Now, now, Lord, 
I have discovered, I've discovered the glory of God is the Hebrew word kabot, means the weight. I ask the Lord to lean on people who bug me. Lord, just lean on them. Just put your weight on them, your glory. Pick a fight with me. Lord, lean on them. What's going on? That's just the glory of God. It's the glory of God resting on you. Not because he hates you, because he loves you. Now we all understand that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Don't start praying against people. I know that was Old Testament, but that was David. It was Old Testament. He was under a different covenant. He wasn't under a new covenant. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I don't go curse that person because God's not in the business of cursing people. But God is in the business of destroying principalities and powers that want to work through people. So I go, Lord, that selfish ambition, I break its hold. Lean on it. Break that thing. That thing, that spirit of fear, I rebuke you. You have no right with me. That thing, I'm not going to stand. You go down. And, and we begin to take some aggressive prayers. I dare you to start for some praying for some specific outcome. Lord, I want this thing. Could you close this deal for me, Father? We need this. I'm praying for my business. I'm asking for my family. I'm praying for our nation. Could you break that thing? Could you open that door? By this I will know my God is for me. When my enemies turn back, that's what David said. I described the problem, number one. But secondly, I start asking for specific outcomes. Some of you have just said, oh, Lord, would you bless me? And he's going, sure, what do you want? You have not because you ask not. It's time for us to go some specific things. Well, I just think, I just think that would be offensive to God. What father or mother in the room is offended when your child is specific? I want that doll. I want that bike. You don't go, how dare you ask for that? You go, yeah. And so when we go, Father, could you help me? Now, obviously, obviously, if you ask for selfish, foolish, destructive things, God's going to go like, hey, come here. Let me explain some stuff to you. But I'm just assuming that we're all grown up enough to get that and get, move beyond. Do you, know, do you understand? I'm not talking about selfish, whimsical nonsense for you. I'm talking about stuff that's real, that's important, that people's lives count on. Knowing the Lord sees and is recording my struggle is amazingly comforting, comforting to me. I don't like this pressure, and I don't like this pain. I don't like the threats that I'm under. But in the middle of this pressure and under the pressure and the stress that I'm facing, I dare to stand and look at my God and say, this is for you. Have you ever been in a situation where they, where they tested you, like somebody jumps out behind and goes, Wah! And, and, you, and you scream like a little girl? And you wish, Can I, I wish I had a do-over. And then, and then, you know, they come and scream and I act all you know, calm. And so sometimes it's in, in life it's been like that. I, like I hit a set of circumstances and then I act all full of unbelief and worldly. And then I go, oh, you were watching that, weren't you, Dad? And he goes, yeah. Can, can, can we? I'd like to do that again, but next time I'd like to respond in faith. Next time I'd like to respond maturely. Could you, could you teach me? Because I don't want to scream like a little girl again, you know. I, I want to be. So next time, next time there's pressure, in the middle of the pressure, I don't want to go, oh, my whole life I'm dead. This is pervasive. It's personal and it's permanent. Next time I want to go, man, there's pressure. But you are my glory and the lifter of my head. And to yeah. you I lift up my soul and I trust you. And I just know, I have no idea, but I trust in you. And, and you're going to, I like that response. You see, that response under pressure, that I'm trusting you for this, is like a, it's like a sacrifice of praise. Very, very precious to the Lord. Remember me, Lord. This is my deliberate response to you in this set of circumstances. Precious secret number three, part three. Decide to put your trust in the Lord. Verse three. 
This is, the, this is the psalm of the precious secret to fear. When I am afraid, not if, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God is word I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? David said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. There is a deliberate action when I am afraid. In the day of my fear, when I am most terrified, at the height of the threat, at its most imposing, I put my trust in you. When there is no escape, when all is lost, when there are many reasons why fear should rule, I put my trust in you. In the midst of their jeers and their whispers and their plottings, I put my trust in you. I choose in this session, in this moment, to put my trust in you. And when my own heart or body or spirit feel like they're giving up, and when my courage has gone, when my head hangs low, I put my trust in you. When it seems like it will never relent and the pressure is too great and the battle is too long and the enemy is too strong, I put my trust in you. The psalm of the precious secret. What are you afraid of right now? David wrote this on the threat of death. When it seemed... 99% sure he would not live out the day. He wrote Psalm 56, verse 3, when I am afraid. Because the Bible says he was very much afraid. In that moment, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And when I put my trust in you, my fear disappears. What are you afraid of right now? Well, I want to dare you to stare it down. I want you to look at it with contempt. And then I want you to look at the Lord. I want you to look with adoration and thanks. And tell the Lord, I put my trust in you. Because Psalm 25, Romans 9, Romans 10, 1 Peter 2 all says, anyone who hopes in you will never be put to shame. Those who believe in him will not be put to shame. Those who trust in him will not be put to shame. Same concept, same scripture. If you trust the Lord, you won't, you won't suffer shame. Hey, Greg, I don't understand. I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how God's going to work it together. It's not important that you know how right now. What is important is that when you fear, you put your trust in the Lord. So I want to close this message with a prayer. And I want to pray it for every person who is facing some sort of fear. Maybe it's a fear that you believed, maybe it's a lie that the enemy said the Lord will never come through for you. Other people are seeing miracles, other people are seeing testimonies, but it'll never happen for you. Maybe that's your fear. Maybe we need to break that. Maybe some of you are sitting like, God's ticked with you. God's never going to come through for you. God's never going to care for you. Maybe we need to break that fear. Some of you have fears about the future, about what could possibly happen and about where you're going to be financially and all of those kinds of fears. Some of you are facing that kind of fear. Today, we're going to break that off. But it starts with us looking at our God and saying, I'm choosing when I am afraid. I put my trust in you. Maybe it's a dream that you thought is long dead. Maybe it's a child that you thought is long gone. Maybe it's a hope that you see no way for. I'd like to pray with everybody who would like to stand with me. And we're going to break fear off God's people. And we're not going to take it anymore. But today we're going to say, Lord, we we reject this fear. But we choose as one man 
with one voice, with one decision, I put my trust in you. And I'm not going to let the whispers, and I'm not going to let the circumstances, and I'm not going to let the fears dictate to me how I respond to my God. I am going to put my trust in my God in the middle of this. Now, David ends the psalm because it, he finished the psalm when, they, when, he, when he got out. The Lord gave him some wisdom. David drooled on his beard. The Ashish thought he was having an epileptic attack. Ashish's wife had epilepsy. So Ashish didn't want another epileptic in the house. He said, I don't want this guy. Get him out of here. And they kicked him out of the city. And David walked away, and he finished the psalm. Verse 12, he said, I'm under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Promise me, when we finish this prayer and fear leaves you, and you see God transform the circumstances that threatened you today, when he turns it around, promise me that you'll write your own psalm of thanksgiving. That you, out of your own mouth, will say, I'm under vows to you and I'll present my thanks to you. Promise me that you'll get up and testify. This is what our God did. So if you want to pray, pray with me. We're going to break something off people today. So will not you stand with me, please? Father, in Jesus' name, I want to stand with uh, uh, these brothers and sisters who are standing before you. And Father, I don't care what the fear is. I don't care what the set of circumstances is. I don't care how much pressure or how long or how great the enemy is. I declare, Lord, that you are greater still by massive margins. And, Father, we just say right now in Jesus' name that we decide to put our trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. This is a precious secret, Father. And today we turn our hearts. And with all that is in us, we believe in you. And now in Jesus' name, I come up against fear and I rebuke and break it off the life of every person in this room. I break every lie that the enemy has spoken. I break fear off. Fear you have no right on the people of God. I destroy you off them now. In Jesus' name, you will leave. But Lord, I release the peace of God and the hope of God and the joy of God into the lives of your people, and we will walk in this victory, and we will see the deliverance of God. You said, Lord, call to me, and I will answer you, and then you will praise me. And so, Father, we call this day for every set of circumstances that is represented by somebody standing here. We call to you, Father, and we trust in you. Turn it around for your glory and give us a psalm of praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. and amen. Praise God. Woo!